Hi, fellow sailors, and welcome back to the 2021 season. I know it's early February, and uh, we still have snow on the ground here in the Detroit area, and I'm sure that's true across the uh, greater Midwest. But uh, my name is Greg Norman, your host for Inside Great Lakes Sailing, and we begin our second season tonight. We did 36 shows last year. We plan to bring you another 36 shows this, this next uh, year, and hopefully we will carry that all the way through until September. The show Inside Great Lakes Sailing will be seen on Friday nights, and we will uh, put uh, together hopefully a, a good collection of interviews with some very famous folks that are involved in sailing and at the same time bring you some, some local interest and some local flavor uh, that covers a, a wide variety of topics, including cruising this year. We want to get a little involved in maybe visiting some yacht clubs and visiting some harbors that maybe you haven't seen, and we're going to have a try at that instead of just doing all of the sort of COVID-based programming that we do with interviews over, over YouTube. Our, uh, our show for the second season gets kicked off with what I think is a terrific guest. Um, if you're not sure, familiar with Betsy Allison, she is the adult director for U.S. Sailing. She handles a wide variety of programs, and she's going to be discussing that. What's really cool about listening to Betsy is her passion for the sport. And uh, coming around, uh, she started at uh, Benegate Bay, which is a home to the guys like Gary Jobson and, and uh, Dave Perry, people she sailed with. And it's really kind of fun if you listen to it. So hopefully this, you'll pay attention to the interview, and I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, stick around, and we'll uh, be right back. Welcome back to another season of Inside Great Lake Sailing. My name is Greg Mormon. We are lucky enough to have with us today Betsy Allison, who is the Adult Services Director for U.S. Sailing. Have I got that title right? Well, it's actually the Adult Director. I call myself the Director of Adult Programs, but call it what you will. It's no. still... <laughs> I, want to make, I, want to make sure, I want to make sure we're right. We're going to talk about a bunch of things, but my very first question is, you've had, we're six weeks into 2021, and we have faced COVID for a while. And I'm just curious in your position where that fits and you know, what's, what's kind of over the next 90 to 120 days, where are you with the, with, with the disease the, the, and the sport? And where, are, where is U.S. sailing at at the moment? Well, we've been having these internal discussions about COVID. Obviously, things are rapidly changing with the now the uh, vaccine being out there and being administered in many communities. Of course, it's not uh, the ultimate fix for the situation we find ourselves in because you know, different areas of the country have different issues and, and uh, it's ever evolving. However, um, last year and it, it's about this time, a little, you know, about this time when COVID first reared its ugly head, U.S. Sailing took on an initiative to help create some guidelines uh, to help our constituents, our, our sailing organizations, yacht clubs, community sailing programs, to give some guidance into how to navigate the COVID waters, so to speak. And all of those resources are listed on our website. Um, we, we encourage all of our, our uh, member clubs and organizations, as well as fleets and, and class associations and sailors within U.S. Sailing, to be aware and um, and follow local, state, and county guidelines, you know, because again, it, you know, it changes based on where you are in the United States. But um, we have found in a very positive way that a lot of our uh, killboat schools, our powerboat providers, uh, youth sailing programs that have followed protocols, social distancing, mask wearing cleaning equipment uh, between uses and being really diligent about following their local state and federal guidelines that uh, many programs were able to open last year. Uh, some did not, you know, especially uh, with some of our schools that have older sailing instructors, they were concerned about the health and well-being of their, uh, their staff, especially volunteer uh, staff. But Many of them were pleasantly surprised by being able to work within safety guidelines to be able to have very successful sailing seasons. And it's been interesting too, because many of the fleets out there, racing fleets in San Francisco in the Bay Area, all of the different counties around the Bay had different rules and regulations 
So, uh, for example, the J-105 fleet joined U.S. Sailing and decided as a fleet they would start running their own races, having everybody come out and meet on the water, do racing on the water, and go back home to their own locations, their own docks. So people have been creative within the confines of COVID to make sailing happen. And I think that's a tribute and testament to the, uh, the strength and the, um, the creativity of our sailing community. We're just finishing up a, a ski racing season here. I'm a ski racing coach in the, in the, in the wintertime. We have literally had can't plan four days ahead. So the best laid plans for U.S. sailing, I would think that you're, you're just sort of on the edge like the rest of us. Because it could literally change as it as it does. You point out that you know everybody met met on the water. We did that with our junior sailing program last year, and everybody kind of tugged tugged their boats home. We try to find one central spot and, and kind of move forward. Does managing from the cheap seats does that does that create headaches for you as a as a director? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we can only give guidance. We can't mandate to any. Uh, to any organization on how they should operate on a day-to-day basis. I mean, there are so many factors to consider. And again, you know, we, we, um, there are recommendations and guidelines that have come from the CDC and other, you know, uh, federal and, and state um, and, and, and local uh, uh institutions that are are affecting our constituent groups so again you know we will guide people to the right places we will advise them on what we know but ultimately again i think everyone has to really look at what's happening locally and make the make the decisions on whether to run programming or racing based on the changing environment and what they're, what the rules and regulations they're subject to in their individual locations. So, you know, it might be, you know, uh, uh, cheering on from the cheap seats, but, you know, we as a national organization are concerned about the health and well-being of all the sailors across the United States. And we, you know, we just urge people to use caution and be safe in how they choose to um, operate their sailing and boating activities. So also be pointed out the U.S. Sailing is a volunteer member organization, but at the same time, it is much more than just doing, uh, just, you know, organizing sail racing. It is, it's, it's a plethora of, of programs and, and activities and education that, that are provided. And I think sometimes the real rail service forget those ideas because there, there is, look at your website. And I think sometimes we don't realize all that you offer as, as an organization. Is that a fair statement? Well, I I think that is a very true statement, Greg. Um, You know, I think there are some misconceptions that have been promoted out in the field about what U.S. sailing is. Yes, we are the national governing body of the sport and Olympics is an elite sailing is a high priority for the organization. You know, by a mandate of the federal government, we are the national governing body for the sport. However, our mission goes much further than that. We we do a lot of education training and train instructors on how to deliver sailing education and power boating education to the community. And that is a big part of our business, whether it's on the youth sailing side of things where we've had structured training programs in place since the early 80s when we revised our training scheme are our uh, keelboat providers, which are sometimes yacht clubs or community sailing programs, but also commercial schools that are out there using our structure uh, to be able to deliver education. And I will say one thing that we're really proud of with our education programs is the standards that we adhere to and the standards that we hold our instructors to as well as the, uh, the schools and providers that, that are delivering education. We, we, we mandate safe sport training for every one of the instructors that we train so that they can recognize and prevent abuse and misconduct out in the field. And you know what a better environment for parents to be able to send their kids to a program where their instructors are well-versed and, and trained in preventing abuse and misconduct, you know, whether it's bullying, whether it's, you know, other uh, uh, types of misconduct. I mean, we want to make our 
instructors aware and our providers aware that safety is paramount and all of our race officials are trained as well. So it's, we're, we're going one step above and beyond to make sure that sailing is a great sport for everybody. Welcome back to, uh, I guess this is the second year of the start of uh, the Mission Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host, and we we're fortunate enough to have with us Betsy Allison, who is the Adult Director for U.S. Sailing. And Betsy, I want to start and, and kind of cover a couple areas. I want to start with, we're going to talk a little bit about your background, because you may be one of the best female sailors this country's produced. Five-time Rolex watch uh, Yachtsman of the Year, uh, Tufts Honorable College Racer, the whole deal. Um, master instructor, and I'm, we'll get into the, it, all the accolades, but I guess I want to start with two things. Explain a little bit what the adult director does for U.S. Sailing as a, as a point, and then I want to talk a little bit about the One Design Portal as a part of that program, and, and just kind of give us an idea that there's actually places you can go on your website and find a lot of really cool information, and kind of tie those things together and maybe give us an understanding so that if I'm out here as a volunteer, and maybe I'm running something. I'd have no idea who to talk talk to. You're, you're a phone call away sometimes. That's absolutely right. And we are very accessible to anybody who wants to discuss what we do, the programs that we administer. You know, I answer questions all day long by email or phone. And every one of those inquiries is welcome. You know, whether you have a problem, whether you have something good to say, we welcome it all. I mean, we can't. Uh, move forward and help change the landscape and environment if we're not accessible to people. Uh, in my role as uh, the adult director at U.S. Sailing, I oversee seven different programs at U.S. Sailing. I oversee our keelboat and powerboat education and school network. So those are two programs. I oversee the administration of our safety at sea training. So we issue somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 safety at sea certificates annually um, through U.S. Sailing, through uh, workshops and safety at sea courses that are being offered nationwide. And they're not just for offshore racers. They're for cruising sailors. They're for you know, people that are out power boating near shore or in coastal environments. So that's a third program. I oversee our adaptive sailing across the United States um, and, and providing access and opportunity inclusivity um, for those, those sailors. And it's everything from physical disability, intellectual disability, you know, deaf, PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, et cetera. Um, I oversee uh, First Sail, which is an experiential two-hour try sailing opportunity that we offer through U.S. Sailing. And that's, uh, it, that's actually promoted out by a lot of our local sailing organizations that are members of U.S. Sailing. I oversee our 10 adult sailing championships that are everything from the uh, adult championships for the Mallory Trophy, U.S. single handed U.S. multi-hole, U.S. team racing, offshore, match racing, et cetera. And then lastly, which ties into your question about the One Design uh, Central Portal, um, I have recently in the last two years taken on the One Design classes and associations because there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that sail One Design boats, whether recreationally or racing. And we felt that it was important to re-engage with that community and to be able to provide some great valuable resources to that community. And it's a community that I grew up in. And it's a community that I still sail in regularly. So for me, that's part of the passion of the job is being able to offer um, resources and communication, an avenue of communication to U.S. sailing for those associations and sailors. 
what kind of information is on the portal? Well, well it's we- pretty it, it's pretty cool. The um, One Design Central portal was created um, in response to a survey we sent out at the end of 2019. We wanted to know how One Design sailors in the United States felt about U.S. sailing, what they felt we were doing well for them, what we could do better. And as a result of that survey, we had 180 people volunteer to be part of working parties to help us create One Design Central. So through that, we created a page where some of the features are Uh, We do a monthly One Design line, which is a One Design newsletter that has four stories that go out uh, every month. This past month went out yesterday, and it was all about race admin and how it affects One Design sailors. We created a feature where class associations could list their class by type, whether it's keelboat, um, dinghy. We have land and uh, ice boats. We have foiling classes, radio controlled, so you can go to that feature. And if you're interested in looking at radio controlled sailing, you click on that and it will show classes that have listed themselves through US Sailing's portal. We're also um, doing a more developed search feature for fleets. So if you, for example, are coming from the Midwest to New England and you wanted to find one design classes in the Newport, Rhode Island area because you wanted to connect while you were here on vacation, you can do a search by class, by boat type, by city and state, and it will list all of the fleets that are in that location. So it's perfect for someone on vacation, perfect for college students that are moving elsewhere in the United States for a new job and they want to reconnect uh, with, or not reconnect, but connect with a fleet to where they're moving to. So there's features like that. And then we also have a section that has resources and it might be uh, race management related. It might be speed related. It might be uh, class management related. So this, this website and portal is ever evolving, but it's mainly through the interaction of US sailing with the classes and the one design sailors so that we can keep creating content and posting content. We're not even creating all the content. It's really curating and collating and putting all the content in a place that's easily accessible for the One Design Sailor. As the adult director, how much of your time, and I'm curious to know from a just an attrition standpoint, how much of your time is devoted to promotion? How much is your time is devoted to, you know, just process? And are we are we gaining sailors? Are we losing? We keep hearing all the junior stuff about we have to find more bodies and we have to continue to make sure we expand the sport. At the adult level, are we maintaining numbers? And I guess that goes back to my promotion versus progress and, and process question. Where, where are we in terms of uh, U.S. sailing? Well, you know, our numbers have been fairly static over the last number of years. I mean, p- the membership ebbs and flows over time. Our adult memberships tend to uh, remain fairly constant over time. However, you know, we all realize that as um, you know, our our in- work environments, family environments ebb and and change and flow with the times. That people's um, leisure time has become more and more valuable to them and people have to make choices on how they're gonna spend that time. But I think one of the positive effects that COVID has had on sailing and boating in general is that people are finding sailing a safe place to spend time with their families. People are reconnecting with their adult children and families and doing things collectively together because they can. And I think it's reigniting an interest in the sport of sailing and in power boating that we haven't seen in quite some time. So I'm hopeful that we can spread the word and get more people to join U.S. Sailing and become members and stay members because of the value that we bring to them, not just as racing sailors, but as cruising sailors and part of the community. Because honestly, you know, we run our operation. We have, I think, about 50 staff now at U.S. Sailing that's working on everything from 
member engagement up through Olympic development programs and the Olympic side of the house. But we're really trying to provide services that people feel, uh, feel are valuable. You know, and we really want to find ways to engage with the, 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 the people that are crewing on boats, you know, that are sailing in perf races. The owners, yes, they join because they want certificates and ratings and whatnot. But, you know, why we want those crews to be part of U.S. sailing. We want every one design sailor to be part of U.S. sailing. And we don't want to do it through having to mandate membership through participation in races. That's crazy. You know, it's, it's far. There are some sports that say you can't participate in X, Y, Z unless you're a member of the organization. We want people to be members. We don't want to have to mandate it. I find it interesting as a, a novice guy involved in the racing. I've sailed my whole life, but one of the, the one of the paradigms of this sport is that every other sport we know, you play at the high school or the collegiate level. Maybe you're lucky enough to play professionally, but by the time, for the most part, ninety nine percent of us, by the time we're twenty five, are engaged in. If you're involved in the sport, either you're a weekend warrior or, you're, more importantly, you're coaching at at a high level. Sailing is one of the more unique sports where you could literally be a 50-year-old and be a national champion. I think of Skip Diebel here in, in, in Michigan, in yeah. Pro Seal, he's a national champion. I think he, Skip is 51, 52. When you're a competing internationally and nationally at that level for such a long time, some of the normal things that fall off to the side where you're being a coach and you're doing different kind of things, and I think sailors, generally speaking, don't play a lot of other sports. They sail. And if, and if they're real hardened sailors, they're in Florida right now sailing. And I'm looking out my window and seeing snow. And I think that's, that's, that's at the upper end of that sport, that top 20%. They think of it differently because they do have a lifetime competitive careers. And I don't think that's true in any other sport. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you might see it a little bit in skiing. You know, I think that's another sport where you see kids coming in and then people are skiing as adults and then, if they're competitive, of course, that drops off at some point in time. But usually once you're a skier, you're a skier, you're a lifer. You ski for you know, recreationally going forward. But what um, I'm saying is what I'm saying is Franz Klammer isn't still running the downhill at, at, at age 65. No, you're right. But from a competitive side of things, you can be a competitive sailor from the time you're a youth sailor up right. through you know, your, your mature adult years. And, and, you know, look at Walker. He was competing into well into his eighties at a high level. So you're make, yeah, you're making my point. You're making exactly. my point. And exactly. I think that changed. I think it skews a little bit the way you look at the sport as an athlete, because you do have this lifetime opportunity. If you have the, the tools to be a, a nationally ranked state sailor at 50, 60. Oh, well. and, that, and, and I think that's true, but not everybody is going to be a nationally ranked sailor, but what's so unique about our sport, and when you mentioned Skip D-Ball and some of the other, um, you know, high-level one design sailors that uh, I've been fortunate to, to know over the years, you will find those very same sailors giving back to the sport and giving advice to sailors in the fleet, you know, call them weekend warriors, call them those people that come out all the time because they appreciate the opportunity to be able to sail against the icons in the sport on a regular basis, to learn from them and, you know, to go out and knock heads with them on the race course and come back at the end of the day and share a beverage and a conversation. And I think that's so important in the sport of sailing. And, you know, it has changed from the time when I was a, a young girl growing up on Barnegat Bay, you know, we just messed around in boats all the time. I was a good local sailor. I would not say I was a great sailor. You know, I was not looking to be a nationally ranked sailor as a, as a kid, but I enjoyed what I did. I was doing it with my friends. When I went to Tufts, I was exposed to another group of people who were super high level and I learned from them and I started to learn what I didn't know. And then from there, my career, I realized that I had an aptitude for the sport and my career evolved, my sailing career evolved from then. I was not a pro sailor. I've never been paid to go sailing, but some of what I was able to achieve has laid the groundwork for other women that have come behind me. And I remember when we were doing uh, the road to Rolex clinics before the International Women's Keelboat Championships, 
and I came out to, uh, to Ohio and did a clinic in J24s or J22s. And at that clinic was um, Anna Tunnicliffe and her mom. And Anna was a teenager. So it was nice to see that family engagement of mother and daughter in these development clinics that really was at a point in time where many more women were coming into their own on a national and international stage. And look at where Anna's gone. You know, she's gone on to Olympic medals. She's gone on to be, you know, uh, uh, you know an icon in fitness and, and whatnot. And she's done some co-sailing too. So again, doors open, opportunities present themselves. And it all starts um, in those community uh, engagements with people that are giving back to the sport to bring people along to help them achieve whatever potential they can. Let me take you back to Barnegat Bay. When, when, two questions. Obviously, Barnegat Bay must be special water because Gary Jobson, Dave Perry, there's a lot of guys that, that have come out of that area that have had great sailing careers. But my question to you is, when did you know that this was a passion of yours? And then the follow-up question is, when did you know that you could make a living at this? Um, well, I would say I've always enjoyed, well, when I, my father and my mom and dad joined a, a yacht club when I was uh, eight years old. And when I was told that I had to take sailing the first year, I hated it because it was something I was told I had to do. Right. But it, for me, I really started to enjoy the sport and participate in it in a lot of one design classes and everything from sunfish to scows to blue jays to lightnings and whatnot. But it was the community that lifted me along as a, a, as a, a youth sailor and as a teenager. And then again, when I went to college, uh, I was in a unique situation the day before I started my college career, my dad passed away. So I went to Tufts, not intending to sail at all while I was there, but friends of friends came to my dorm room, dragged me down to the lake and said, you need to, go, you need to come sailing. And that's when I realized that sailing, um, that I was good at it and that I could be better. And I was mentored by several coaches, Joe Duplin, Ken Legler, uh, people like Dave Perry, who has, uh, had, had just finished at Yale and he was coaching some of the single-handed stuff that I started doing. So those were people that mentored me and encouraged me to further my sailing career. And people I sailed against in college, like Kenny Reed, who had a J24 when the women's keelboat uh, regatta first started the first uh, that first uh, keelboat event in 1985 I called up Kenny and said hey can I borrow your J24 and then paired up with a bunch of my lightning girlfriends none of us who had ever raced a keelboat before um, banded together to sail that event and Kenny taught me how to sail a J24 on paper at the handy lunch in Newport I still have the notes they're on little three by five um, pages from a notebook Wow. Yeah, he showed me how to how to uh, a cross sheet and where everybody should be on a boat. And after that meeting, I went down to the boat and said, girls, this is how we're going to do it. I had no idea whether it was going to work or not. But again, that's when my passion was really sparked and fired up from college sailing onward. And I never would have thought that I would have found myself doing what I'm doing now in administration at U.S. Sailing. But I think it's a really... Uh, I bring a lot of experience, personal experience in a lot of different areas to this job. And my passion for the sport is, is unabated. I, I love what I do. I love my job every day. I've got two uh, amazing women that work with me in the adult programs who are dedicated and hardworking. So when you ask how much time do I spend promoting and how much time, you know, do I get in the weeds doing admin stuff? You know, personally, from my director level, I'm doing, I should be doing far more promotion, but there are times when I roll up my sleeves and get down and dirty in the programs and help get the job done. So again, you know, I wouldn't say it's 50-50. I think every day is a new day and we do what we need to do to really um, get fresh ideas out there to engage the community. 
Do we use U.S. sailing as a community? And I mean, obviously, the top racers are, are engaged all the time. But do we use U.S. sailing as much as we should or much as we realize we should? Sometimes I think it gets lost in the weeds. And I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just think it's it's a lot of national organizations have to spend a lot of time promoting themselves because sometimes we just forget with U.S. lacrosse, um, you get involved. Everybody thinks it's a magazine and, and, a, and a membership card. And, then, and you look at all the other things that they do, and sometimes you have to remind them. And I guess maybe that's the promotional part of volunteer organizations. But I'm not sure we get the best. That's not really true. I don't think we get the most out of it in this area. And maybe distance is part of that. Is that, is that a conversation that ever happens at U.S. Sailing? I don't think it's really a distance thing. What we've been, again, what we've found within U.S. Sailing that we've really, how we've really been trying to connect with the communities is, again, to provide the services that you guys use out in the field. And I would be, I, I think a lot of people um, take for granted some of what we do, you know, in, in making sure that the racing rules of sailing are, are published and out there and available every four years. This year uh, in December, we launched an app function where on your smartphone, you can pull up a rule, a rule book. You can file protests um, digitally. There's an, uh, an animated app within the app to be able to do animated diagrams within a protest format. And Dave Perry's understanding of the racing rules is linked to the rule book. Everybody who's racing is using the rules in the rule book. Right. Most of the, um, the race officials that, that are involved with local uh, and national sailing events are U.S. sailing trained officials. Again, we utilize them, but people don't really think about how that relates back to U.S. sailing. Uh, most of the instructors that are out teaching in the field, the kids of all these sailing programs are level one trained. Some are level two, level three. Coaching assets are being trained. So again, I think a lot of the services are being used but people don't, you know, instantly associate those services with U.S. sailing. So could we do a better job of promoting ourselves? Of course, we can always do a better job. But right. I think one way during COVID that we've reached out to the community is through our Starboard Portal series, where we've been having um, workshops and, and hour-long sessions where people have been invited to present on everything from COVID to diversity and inclusion in a lot of areas to touch on topics that are of importance to the community and to engage them through that uh, portal vehicle. So again, we're trying to adapt and change with the times to be able to meet people and share with them what we do and to address concerns that they have. As a, you've been in a master instructor for just under short of 40 years. <laughs> as, a, as a master instructor, I, I guess it's just a more of a curiosity question from a coach to an instructor because just I, I was I always think of terms of the educational process of coaching. What's yeah. the, what's the thing that drives you the craziest as a master instructor in a general sense with the population and the people that you've taught? Well, I mean, there's not much that drives me really crazy to be honest. I mean, I've seen a lot of things over a lot of years, and um, as a master. Well, look, let me ask a better question then. Let me ask a better question. What is it that maybe what what's the biggest misconception from people coming to you that you have to set straight? Maybe that's the, the process. Maybe that's a better question. Well, I think some of it is someone might come in to want to take an instructor program and says, I've been sailing my entire life. But just because you're a good sailor, you know, or a good coach doesn't mean that you have the instructional skills to deliver the material in effect in an effective way. And that's one of the things, as I mentioned earlier in the program, that we are really passionate about with our uh, instructor programs is the, um, the, the uh, protocol that we have in place, the, the standards that we hold our instructors and coaches to when they're working in the field. And that's an evolving process, but being able to reach people, you know, uh, people learn in different ways and to be able to present material in different ways to, to affect those people in a positive way, I think 
those are some of the things that we require our instructors to learn and to demonstrate. And I think when, when we've had people skeptical about taking our instructor programs, they come out of it saying, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how much I learned just by going through the process and presenting and learning that structure. So I think that's probably the most um, interesting thing that I've learned as a master instructor trainer is, is how people are become receptive to methodology and structure within the uh, education delivery system. I think of uh, aunts and uncles or aunts specifically that have good taste but they think they're interior designers who maybe go to college for four years. And I have family members and friends who I coach professionally at the collegiate level. And I spent a, a lifetime as a, as a career. I worked for the New York Times for a long time. So I'm, I was a writer. Everybody can write, but then get paid for it. Everybody can coach. You know, you coach my little league team, but now you're coaching at, at a collegiate level and you're getting paid. I, I, you can't help the comparisons because they think they can just jump in. But it's the ten. it's a 10,000 hours. It takes the time to learn your craft. It takes the time to, to, to process that. So my follow-up is, it sounds like from what you're suggesting, that there's just as much time into delivery systems of that information as it is the information itself, because without that delivery system and an understanding of it, it doesn't matter if you know what a Cunningham is. It just doesn't, exactly. it doesn't make That's any exactly sense. That's exactly right. And, and uh, with a lot of our keelboat instructor programs, it's an evaluative assessment that uh, we look at what the instructor knows, but also how they deliver it and how and their ability to demonstrate those skills to the students that are taking those courses. So I think, you know, we do that, we teach process and steps in level one in, in youth sailing. A lot of uh, sailing instructors come out of youth sailing programs. And if they were not taught effectively, they, they struggle to find their, um, their mojo right away, you know, to, sorry about that, to um, follow their processes. So we teach them how to, how to read and write a lesson plan. We teach them how to do demonstrations. We teach them how to present. We teach them how to run an effective water drill. And yes, does it take time and practice for them to get really skilled at it? Of course, but to not give them the fundamentals would be doing a disservice to the sailing community. And, and again, it has evolved over 40 years of time since the early 80s is when the structured program took effect. And it's, it's so nice now to see kids coming in as level one instructors who know what the scoop method is, to know, you know what a mass tip lift is in terms of, of uh, rescues out on the water. So it's encouraging to see the strides we've made over time. And again, our education department does a phenomenal job in the development and evolution of the programs as we go forward. We're always learning as our, our students and candidates are learning. So, you know, it's great. Cool. I wanted to touch briefly, you had spent, I think, uh, about 15, 16 years coaching the uh, Paralympic team. Yep. And just kind of sort of summarize, I think that's a such a, was a wonderful opportunity. I just maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I spent um, the better part of 20 years working with, with Paralympic sailors on a national and international scale. Um, I worked for uh, 10 years full time on staff with U.S. Sailing, coaching our Paralympic sailors and developing our national team. And, uh, it, you know, I got into it because a guy that I raced lasers against back in my early days of my career had subsequently been in a car accident, lost a leg. There happened to be a, a world championship in Newport, Rhode Island in 1998, and he knew I lived here. And he said, you know, you're, you're a good sailor, Betsy. You live in Newport. You're a local extra. Will you coach the team? And in all honesty, I had never worked uh, with a sailor who had a physical disability before. And it was, it was eye-opening for me. But when I met the six gentlemen that I was working with, two of whom were quadriplegics, um, I went down to the boat, introduced myself, and I said, once I understand the physical parameters and what everybody is capable of doing on board, uh, I'm not gonna coach you any differently than I would coach an able-bodied sailor. 
Wow. And that is exactly what we did. We had five days of training before the world championship started. And uh, our U.S. teams finished first and second, a quarter of a point apart in that world championship with the Germans a quarter of a point behind that. So it was a very tight championship, but that really um, started my love and passion for that part of the sport because um, with, with parasailing, uh, we utilize adaptations that help minimize the impact of the disability on the sailing of the boat and maximizes the capabilities of the sailor. So the focus is on the sailor, on the tactics, on the strategy, on the execution, and you don't focus on the disability. And that's where sailing for people that, uh, that have a challenge, you know, a, a physical challenge, a vision impairment. It is amazing to me how many blind sailors are the best upwind sailors sailing in a groove than any, sa- you know, of, of all the sailors I know, because they don't have those distractions of looking at a boat tour, of, of, of focusing on something other than staying in the groove and, and using their other senses to allow them to sail upwind most effectively. It's amazing to me. So I've learned from those sailors and with those sailors through my involvement. How did you come to such a quick determination that it was, I'm just going to, you know, obviously they have limitations, but the reality to it is I'm just going to teach you to sail like a sailor would sail. What, what, just instinct? Well, um, I guess, I mean, but that's what the sport's about. You know, you know, you can be any color, you can be any gender, you can be any age. And what's the defining factor? It's how you put your boat around a race course or how you get from point A to point B if you're cruising. Right. Nobody cares whether you're blind or, or vision impaired. Nobody cares whether you're, you know, an amputee or a quadriplegic. And to be honest, when you watch parasailers sail a boat, it is very rare in a fleet, uh, an open fleet, let's say there's a group of sonars out sailing on the water and you've got parasailers mixed in with, with uh, able-bodied sailors, you would be hard pressed right. to point out the difference between which boats are being sailed by which. And that's the beauty of it all. Sailing is for everyone, for anyone, um, regardless of the, the uh, you know, socioeconomic status or bracket they find themselves in, there's opportunities there. And I really think for all of us that are involved in the sports, we just need to make sure we understand that we can and should be welcoming, you know, new people that may not have ever considered sailing as being a sport for them. I coached blind skiers for a lot of years. And about halfway through it, somebody said to me, said, we, we, we want to get you back. And I was really very touched by the fact that he wanted to be as an instructor. And I said, I'm just curious, what is it that I do that's, you know, maybe better than the rest of me? He says, you don't do anything better than the rest of me. He says, you just got a big mouth and we can hear you. <laughs> and, we, and now we can hear you and we just not, we don't, we won't run into trees. He said, some of these, you know, some of the folks that are teaching us just don't have the voice that the booming voice that you have. So he said, when you're skiing and you can't see where you're going, especially down a, a more, so I, a short lived compliment was, you know, but it was, it was the joy that they brought to the, to the process that was so cool. And I think that's what you kind of fall in love with because you're, you're unleashing something that, that we take for granted and they don't. And I think that's exactly. something. And it's pushing them to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. If you're telling a paraplegic who's a wheelchair user to pop up onto the side rail of a boat, right. when they don't have a lot of core stability, that's a frightening prospect. Sure. But once they can do it, it's amazing. I mean, for example, I'll give you, a, this, is a, this is a quick example. I was invited out to um, uh, Delavan Lake in Wisconsin to do a sailing session for the University of Wisconsin Whitewater's wheelchair basketball team. These men had never been on a sailboat before. They came down, a lot of wheelchair users, and bounced their way into these flying Scots. And and the onboard instructors were not allowed to touch the tiller, nor were they allowed to turn the sails. They were only able to instruct and give direction. 
And by the end of the afternoon, we had these athletes doing drills to whistles. And somebody goes, well, how did you get them to do that? I said, they're already basketball players. They do drills to whistles all the time. It's just a different medium that they're participating in. And it was amazing to see how quickly they could pick up on a sport when given some parameters and guidelines and direction and to see the enjoyment that they had of playing in a sport that they had never considered before. So again, you know, with some minor adjustments and adaptations, it, it, it's, it's an enabling environment. You say core strength and I went on my first star ride last year and I didn't realize you had to hang out over the boat and use your core strength. Um, (laughs) I was a pretty good athlete in the day, but my core strength isn't at 66 what it was then. I'm not sure if I wouldn't have got a hand up, I would have ended up with my head in the water and drowned, but that's, that's a, that's a whole nother discussion. And I'm not handicapped in any way, shape or form, but it was, it was fun watching. Um, I want to touch on our last discussion. Kind of want to go back to you've been quoted as saying is that you gain respect on the course as a, as a racer. And there's been a lot of movement in the last four or five years with women's initiatives and things. And I think that's great. We got to get as many folks in boats as we can to have, have a good time. Talk to what us sailing is doing with women's initiatives. And to me, you, it's fun talking to somebody that's so passionate about the sport. You can see your eyes light up when you're, when you're talking and that's, at our ages, and I, I'm not sure where you are in age, but I'm, I'm sure that it's just fun to have that conversation. But with women's initiatives, where are we headed? And is it a matter, is it a matter of respect, not based on gender, but based on talent? I mean, that's a multifaceted question for sure. Um, we've had uh, women's and girls initiatives for years and years. I mean, obviously, uh, but, well, it's not obvious. When I was a young girl, there were no girls only regattas like the lighter trophy or the Ida Lewis trophy for single and double handed. There, there weren't a lot of gender only events for girls. And then, um, you know, in college sailing, there was, you had, you know, women's teams within the um, ICYRA and they still exist, but we were always involved in co-ed sailing as well. And, um, and I think, you know, there was the Adams Cup and the Adams Trophy for women sailing that has gone decades, gone on for decades. However, um, I think that in the earlier parts of my career, I realized that in order to be recognized, not as a female sailor, but just a sailor out on the water, that occurred during my J24 days. And it was not unusual in the mid to late 80s and early 90s for us to have fleets of 90 boats on the starting line. And based on skill, and sometimes I was sailing with a women's team when we sailed with six on board as opposed to the five that the guys sailed. And of course, we took heat for that because we were sailing with four people. And how, you know, how, how do you have enough jobs for six people on board a boat, et cetera? But when we started finishing in the top five regularly and we made our mark on the race course. And of course, I'm, again, I'm sailing against Kenny Reed and and Vince Prune and, you know, all these really well-known sailors, it earned the respect on the water. And I'm seeing that far more now with, um, with women that are sailing in, um, you know, uh, some of the J-boat fleets and the J-70 fleet, there's a lot of female skippers there. In the IC-37s, you have female skippers there. And they're going out and they're being recognized as sailors, not women sailors. And I think that that's really important because again, you know, physiologically, yes, sometimes there are strength issues depending on the type of boat that you choose to sail. However, when push comes to shove, It's what you do on the race course and how you handle yourself that enables you to play at whatever level it is that you want to play. And yes, do we still have some stereotypical behavior that goes on board on boats where you get on board a big boat as a female sailor and, you know, you're put in the pit area, you know, it's happened to me as well, where someone will say, oh, let me do that for you. 
or they'll try to, you know, a, a, a male colleague will try to step in and do your job. And it's always like, no, thanks. You know, I'll ask if I need help. And, and I think uh, some of the women's only initiatives that we're trying to encourage now are to help build that confidence level for women to say, yes, we can do this. And yes, I'm, uh, I'm going to develop into, you know, an equal to my male counter, to my counterpart, male, female, or, you know, whatever, the man in the moon. But um, I, I'm sure you've seen some in uh, the recent initiatives we put out there where uh, I think it was less than 30% of our base admin, our base officials were women. So we're encouraging more women to get involved starting at a club level and then to grow into national level judges, race officials, umpires. And, and we've um, done some initiatives where we've offered some courses for women taught by women. And that's not to be discriminatory in any way, shape or form. It's just that to build that confidence level at the, uh, at the club grassroots level, we want people to be able to feel comfortable to ask questions that might be, they may feel are perceived as simple questions or ones that they might be, um, you know, people might roll their eyes at. And people should be free to ask those questions in a comfortable environment so that they can build up their confidence levels. And then as you get up into more advanced classes, you know, they're all mixed gender. So again, we're not trying to be discriminatory. We're just trying to provide a comfortable learning environment where some women will thrive better. Me personally, I don't care. I would take a class whether, you know, with, with uh, you know, male, female mix or whatever. But there are others that I know that have expressed interest in, you know, being in that all female environment in the early steps of learning. And that's what we're also trying to do by to create more, um, female keelboat instructors. And we want to get in more women of color as instructors and male instructors of color too within the U.S. sailing family. Um, and, uh, and that's why this year we have partnered with the National Women's Sailing Association. We, we signed a memorandum of understanding with them last September to promote out their adventure sail program, which is to engage girls from under sale, uh, underserved communities and introduce them to the sport of sailing. So there will be a National Adventure Sail Day that will um, encourage our member clubs and organizations to participate in on August 14th of this year. We're gonna make that announcement soon, but it's through their work that they've done and established over the years that we can, through our network of organizations, help to expand. And again, it's all about growing the community. Initiative is about enlightenment and about education. Ten years ago, I was hired as the, one of the Michigan State's uh, lacrosse coach. I was the been on my whole life in, in the men's world, and I got involved very quickly in administration at the national level with the coaches association. I actually became president. And a second or third year in, I would bring up an idea, and finally somebody at lunch said to me, "The reason nobody wants to listen is because you're a guy." Now, at 56 or 7, having never been discriminated before in my life, the only reason I'm – my idea I, – I thought a good idea was – it was a good idea no matter where it came from. And one of the things we did with U.S. lacrosse was that women's lacrosse had been behind the times in terms of rules and in terms of operation. And part of it was that bigger, faster, stronger were actually – penalized because they were bigger, faster, stronger. So they made the rules so that everybody was equal. Well, bigger, faster, stronger works in every sport. Doesn't just mean it with, with that. And U.S. lacrosse actually now has some initiative programming for men, coaches, and officials working in the world of women's lacrosse. Because it turns out that it has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with stupidity you know, <laughs> to some extent, which I think is really more accurate to that, to that extent. And probably the best 10 years I ever spent as a coach was coaching you know, 40 women when I had never had a sister nor a daughter. And it opened my eyes to be just a better coach because I had to listen. And I think that's kind of the point you're trying to make is that either you can or you can't. And if you can't, learn to listen. And if you do that, you know, both of our parents told us that you don't get smarter by talking. So there's <laughs> there's some truth to that, I think. I think that's yeah. part, of that, part of that lesson. I agree with you 100%. Well, listen, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated the time you've spent with us. You're a, a very delightful um, 
uh, director. I just think this is terrific. This is great for the opening show. Um, we last, I guess the last question we're, we're, what is a, a, a topic of focus maybe for this year that, that you guys are working on and would send back to us that we would, we would want to pay attention to. Is there something specific? Um, you know, we just uh, outlaid, uh, we just released a new strategic plan for the next four years. And I think one message that we're really passionate about is inclusivity in getting more people of diverse backgrounds and providing opportunity to engage more people in the sport and to think a little uh, unconventionally in the approach, you know, to invite, uh, invite groups to your club or organization that you may never have considered to, um, to do some, some outreach to girls and women to, to embrace, um, you know, just to embrace people and invite them to come down and see what sailing is all about and why we're passionate about it. And, uh, and, and again, to help us spread the message that U.S. Sailing is not just a sailboat racing organization, that we are about community and about education and about um, really uh, bringing more people together to share what's going on in the beauty with the water. You know, I mean, honestly, that's, that's I, I think, so fundamental and it's, it seems so fundamental, yet it's so easy to miss. You made a comment earlier about maybe, well, maybe I'm not the best sailor, but you don't win the Rolex uh, Yachtsman of the Year if, if you don't have some clue what's going on. And I can tell you, being the worst racer on Monday night, double-handed in our club, I, I look up to those folks and want to learn from the best. So uh, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your time. I hope you have a great spring and we have a wonderful summer. And uh, you brought lots of information to our show, and I want to thank you for that. You are very welcome, Greg. It's been my pleasure. And if I make it out in your area, let's go sailing. I got a 30 on anytime you want to go. But absolutely. Appreciate your time and you have a great day.